Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, mammals. This video is going up on Monday, April the 20th, Graham's birthday, and it's going to be covering intermolecular forces and physical properties that depend on them. This is going to be kind of a lengthy video, so this video and the assignment that's attached to it is going to cover NTI for Monday and Tuesday. So you've got two whole days to watch the video and answer the questions that go along with it because this is going to be basically a full class worth of lecture. The topics we're going to get into are forces between molecules, as the name implies, intermolecular forces, and these are all electrostatic forces. So conceptually, that means you should be thinking about our good old friend Coulomb's Law, which says the force is proportional to the strength of the charges between things. So we're going to be looking at different substances and thinking about what kinds of charges are present within them, how big those charges are, and the bigger the charges are, generally the bigger the force. And we're going to be categorizing them based on where they get their charges, what kind of molecules they are that have charges, and giving some vocab terms for that. So I've got a handy flow chart that would be something useful to have in front of you on, on test time. We'll get to that when we come there. And it's going to help you decide what vocab word to use to talk about where these charges come from. The charges that we'll talk about are going to be charges that are permanent, that are always present, and those are going to be from things that are ions, that have like a full charge, and things that are polar molecules, where the molecule that itself does not have a charge but there are regions of partial charge. You could probably be guessing already that the ions being a full charge would have larger Qs and larger forces. So there's going to be more electrostatic attraction there than things that are polar because they simply have partial charges. So the Qs would be smaller, resulting in a smaller force. And that's the right way to be thinking about this. And we'll give different vocab terms as to whether it's coming from ions or from polar molecules. We'll also consider some temporary charges. And this is totally new. We haven't really talked about temporary charges at all. Any kind of molecule has a chance to get one of these temporary charges because they're random. So later in the video, I'll spend some time about what kinds of things lead to these random temporary charges. And since they're random and temporary, that means the Qs are going to be small and fleeting, which means the attractive forces are going to be smaller. We'll tie the strength of these forces to physical properties that are related to how difficult the molecules are to separate. And that's how we're going to link the different kinds of forces present to physical properties, because the physical properties that I'll be talking about are all ones related to getting molecules to move apart. Since a lot of this is going to be based on polar molecules. I thought I would do a review on how molecules become polar going back to the very first unit. And I'll start off by reminding you that individual bonds may be polar based on electronegativity differences. But just because something has polar bonds in it does not mean that the entire molecule is going to be polar. And you have to consider the geometry. For instance, this carbon dioxide molecule, a carbon-oxygen bond is polar. Oxygen is more electronegative. And so these oxygens would be trying to pull the electrons towards themselves in these bonds. However, since it's a symmetric geometry, 
these forces are going to be equal and opposite, meaning no net force in this molecule is nonpolar. My second set here are two molecules with all the same bonds, so water, oxygen, hydrogen, and ammonia, nitrogen, hydrogen. So all the bonds are the same, but the geometries are not symmetric because they've got lone pairs on them. So since the lone pairs take up some room, that makes these bond polar uh, forces not opposite and equal and gives rise to what we call a dipole where the molecule has a region of negative charge and a region of partial positive charge. Dipoles. The word comes from di meaning two and poles like north and south pole. So we've got two because we've got a partially positive and a partially negative and they're on opposite ends usually of the molecule and we would have a dipole kind of the force between it. So the bigger these partial charges are the larger the dipole and that comes about because they're not symmetric. One of the things that I would have on hand if you can get yourself a second screen is the FET molecular shapes website opened up on a separate screen because that's going to avoid you having to memorize things like this is called trigonal planar. Had we been in normal school that's one of the things I would be emphasizing right now is learning to memorize linear bent trigonal planar tetrahedral but we're not going to worry about that because hopefully you can have a separate tab open on some second device and if you need a molecular geometry name you can just hit up FET and plug in the the center atom and how many outside atoms and how many lone pairs and it's going to give you the name for you. Lastly I've got a situation here where I have a symmetric molecule. Let's let this be CH3F. So even though the geometry is symmetric, because I have one atom that is not the same, my dipoles are not going to be symmetric and not going to cancel out. Carbon is ever so slightly more electronegative than hydrogen, so some small dipoles there. Fluorine is a lot more electronegative. So again, this results in a net dipole on this molecule. So wrapping up, you might have polar bonds. If two atoms are not identical, I would presume that the bond has some degree of polarity. Then I'm going to consider, is the geometry symmetrical? And the bond dipoles cancel out, give me a nonpolar molecule. Or is the molecule non-symmetric, either because I've got some lone pairs or some of the atoms are not identical to the others, and then I'm going to have polar molecules. What we're going to move into now, as I alluded to in the beginning, is we give some different vocab terms to the strength of these intermolecular forces based on what kinds of charges are present that causes them. As the name implies, intermolecular forces are between molecules. So this means this term technically only applies to covalent molecular substances only. You're going to lose all your points on any question about this if you make it sound like you're talking about bonds. Intermolecular forces are between molecules. Intramolecular forces would be the bonds that are actually holding the atoms together. They're two very different things. To try and drive that point home, I've got two energies here. 41 kilojoules to vaporize one mole of water. That means to take some water molecules. So I'll draw two water molecules here. 
and they would line up like this so that the positive side on one water molecule lines up with the negative side on the other and there is some intermolecular force holding these two together. And if I vaporize it and put it into the gas state, I'm going to have to move those molecules further apart and break that intermolecular force. And that would cost me 41 kilojoules worth of energy. If I mess up and start talking about bonds, the reason that I would lose all of my points is if I take a water molecule and break the bonds and turn it into individual atoms, that's going to cost me 930 kilojoules to break the two oxygen-hydrogen bonds within a molecule. So completely different by orders of magnitude, which is why you can't mess these two things up. So make sure you don't talk about breaking bonds if really all you're doing is breaking attractive forces. And that means the kinds of places that you're going to talk about this are physical properties, not chemical changes where you're breaking bonds, but physical changes that have to do with separating molecules, boiling them, melting them, letting it evaporate, um, letting it sublime, all things that are related to changing the spatial orientation or changing the state between molecules. Let's get into the terms behind these intermolecular forces and we give them different terms because as Coulomb's law shows the different kinds of charges that are present are going to dictate how strong these forces are. If you have polar molecules so what we're dealing with here is an attraction between partial charges within a neutral molecule. The molecules are neutral because if they've got a partial positive they have an equally partial negative so these are not ions these are only regions of partial charge. The molecules are going to want to line up so that the opposite charges attract each other and these are going to be significant you can't ignore them but they aren't as strong as things that would be caused by attraction of full charges, as in an ionic bond. So these are going to be weaker than the forces between two ions, like salt, holding themselves together, because these are going to be smaller charges, and Coulomb's law shows smaller charges, smaller forces. Hydrogen bonds are kind of a special kind of dipole-dipole interaction um, where these are so strong dipoles that they're entering into a territory that's especially strong and strong enough for us to categorize it differently. And they're going to be present in things that have HN, HO, or HF bonds. Uh, my acronym on this is I've had enough. They're indicated, if you have to, should you have to draw them, I, I think you're not going to be drawing, but if they would be labeled for you, they're going to be labeled with dashes or dots to indicate that this is such a strong inter, intermolecular force, it's almost bordering on a bond. And this hydrogen, many of these things are acidic or have the capability to act as acids and bases, this hydrogen may be being passed back and forth and you end up with a situation where if I draw on this and I make this NH4 plus, I've got a conjugate base and then a conjugate acid left over. Um, so that's why these are kind of categorized differently because they are so strong and many of these things are weak acids and weak bases where this hydrogen is really playing, you know, hot potato back and forth between these two molecules creating 
an especially strong attractive force. Be careful though that just because something has an oxygen or a nitrogen or a fluorine and hydrogens in it, don't assume that it can make hydrogen bonds. So this is acetone, and if you remember our shorthand for carbons, carbons are at ends and bends, and the hydrogens may not be labeled, but carbons would have four bonds. This has an oxygen, and it has hydrogens, but it can't hydrogen bond because the oxygen is not bonded to a hydrogen. It would only have dipole-dipole forces within it because it is a polar molecule. It could receive hydrogen bonds from something that does have an oxygen-hydrogen bond because the lone pairs on this oxygen can hydrogen bond. They can be attracted to this very polarized let me draw a dipole on that. Very polarized, partially positive hydrogen. But it can't make hydrogen bonds with itself. So be on the lookout. Don't label something as having hydrogen bonds unless it actually has the hydrogen-oxygen bond. It's not enough merely to have hydrogens and nitrogens, oxygens, or fluorines. There has to be a bond between those two. We can get into kind of some shades of gray area here. If you have large enough molecules, they can sort of blur the lines between the properties of a polar and a nonpolar molecule, simply because they're so large that they can have regions of the molecule that act chemically different than other regions. One place that this comes into play is what we call surfactants. These are large molecules and they typically have an ionized, whoops, get my highlighter, an ionized region and, or a polar region and a very, very long carbon chain, which is going to be a nonpolar region. Um, this is lauryl sulfate. Um, if you look on the ingredients for your, you know, shower soap or whatever, probably the second ingredient after water is going to be laurel or laureth sulfate or some other sulfate, maybe oleic uh, sulfate, and these are all surfactants. And basically what they do is you've got this big nonpolar region that's going to be attracted to the nonpolar, you know, grease oil. So that is going to get dissolved onto this end of it and then the polar region here is going to be attracted to water and so this is how all of our soaps work because the nonpolar region can grab a hold and dissolve the oil grease grime whatever that you're trying to wash off of you but it has a polarized region or an ionized region that's going to be able to attract to water and carry it away and rinse it off. So that's soaps. If you have um, an ion and something with a dipole, this is going to be a slightly stronger force because now we have a partially charged molecule, a polar molecule, and a fully charged ion. So this is going to be, in general, a little stronger this is kind of a special case because this requires a mixture. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time belaboring these because typically you're going to be comparing things within pure substances. But if you had a mixture, you could have an opportunity to create a ion interacting with a polar molecule, which is going to be a bit stronger than just the two polar molecules acting on each other. Similarly, you can have an induced dipole. This is another case where it has to be a mixture. And that's where you have something with a permanent charge interacting with something that is nonpolar, so no permanent charge, 
and the electrostatics will induce or cause a dipole as the nonpolar substance gets close to the either ion or polar substance. And these are going to be a little weaker than ion dipole in general, or uh, dipole dipole, because one of the things has no permanent charge. Wrapping up here with these is our temporary charges. And these are called dispersion forces. These are temporary and random, and they occur because electrons being in constant motion will occasionally sort of all end up on one side of a molecule, making it have a temporary dipole. The more electrons you have, the more likely this is going to be. Since it's a random force, it's like playing the lottery. If I want to up my chances of winning the lottery, I need to buy more tickets. If I want to up my chances of having a temporary dipole caused by electrons outnumbering themselves on one side versus the other, I need to have more. So comparing some things here, these are all nonpolar molecules. You can see as I go from hydrogen with one electron to fluorine to chlorine to bromine with iodine, these are basically all the same shape molecule, a carbon in the middle with four bonds. It would be a symmetric molecule, so it's nonpolar. But as I add up the number of electrons there, these dispersion forces get stronger. The molecules become more difficult to separate, and my melting point goes up. I'm going to emphasize this. All molecules have dispersion forces. So if you have two things with similar IMFs, the one with more electrons is probably going to have more dispersion forces. Also, the other thing to emphasize is if you have to label the forces that are present. If it's a molecule, I don't care if it's a polar molecule or not a polar molecule, you're going to say that it has dispersion forces in addition to anything else that it has. So all molecules have these, and the AP test always gives um, points for labeling both of them. The dispersion forces also with hydrocarbons, and this goes to other things, the, the more stretched out it is, the easier it is for the molecules to all end up on one side, and so to have higher intermolecular forces. So these are all comparable, and you would just say this one has more electrons than this one. It's going to be more polarizable is your strong word, or your safe word. If we compare things that have equal numbers of carbons and hydrogens, but change their shape, take them from a straight to a bent shape or a branch shape, that decreases their polarizability. I like to think of this as kind of like um, the long balloons like they might use to tie an animal with versus a regular balloon. I'm able to like squeeze and distort the shape of this balloon more than I'm able to like squeeze and distort the shape of a round balloon. So if it's a straighter molecule, it's going to be more polarizable and will have higher dispersion forces. So this is the flow chart that kind of sums all of these up. And I would include a copy of this 
with me while I'm taking the test. Uh, so you guys help me uh, set a reminder. I know some of you may not have printers at home so that I can prepare some packets of other stuff to have if we're not back at school when you're doing the test day. Um, so I want to include this. I want to include the kinetics uh, crib sheet. So when it comes closer time to taking the test, um, Help me remember to gather up these resources for you. But basically, we're going to look at uh, whatever it is that we have that is interacting. Are there ions involved? Yes or no. Um, if there are ions involved, then you come down here to, you know, if it's just ions, it's going to be ionic bonding. Um, if ions and something else present, you're going to have ions and dipoles interacting. If they're not ions, do you have polar molecules? And if you don't have any polar molecules, it's only these dispersion forces. If you do have polar molecules, then you've got the dipole-dipole and the hydrogen bonding, but don't forget dispersion. Anything with a molecule is going to have dispersion forces present. So don't leave that off. Let me go back to this for a second. Generally, very generally speaking, as we're going from this side with no permanent forces to this side with permanent forces involving full charges, generally this goes in the direction of stronger, according to Coulomb's law. However, that's just making even comparisons. If you're comparing something that is very, very large and has lots and lots of dispersion forces to something that is small but has hydrogen bonding, the dispersion forces can dwarf the hydrogen bonding and dispersion forces that are present in the small molecule. So this is only a very general rule. And the AP test in the past has loved to give people inconsistent data with that pattern to see if they kind of understand that it's just a general pattern. So this free response that I've gotten for you here is comparing, asking for the intermolecular forces, and see here where they say all intermolecular forces present in HCl. Um, HCl is a polar molecule, so you need to say dipole, dipole, but it's also a molecule, so you need to say dispersion forces. And then it asks you to infer the strengths of these. This one is a nonpolar substance. So, polar, nonpolar. So the lesser student would say, oh, the dipole-dipole is stronger than the dispersion forces only present in the nonpolar. However, if you look at it, they imply that this one condenses first which would imply that it has a higher um, boiling point. So it has stronger intermolecular forces. So that, that means that the dispersion forces in CCL4 must be higher than the dipole-dipole and dispersion forces in HCl. So the safe language here, after you've identified it, is actually pretty simple. And this has worked for just about all the keys that I've ever seen for this kind of question, is you just say the sum of the IMFs in whatever the compound is, in this case CCL4, is greater than the sum of the IMFs in the other substance. So once you've figured out, they've tried to obfuscate it here by talking about condensing, uh, 
that it's like reverse boiling, that the um, boiling point is higher in CCL4, and a higher boiling point implies higher intermolecular forces, all you have to do is just basically restate them to it. You know, since this data says that the intermolecular forces are greater in CCL4, therefore the intermolecular forces are greater in CCL4. Um, and stay away from kind of anything talking about dipole-dipole forces are stronger than dispersion forces. So they like to ask about inconsistent data. I'm going to finish with things that are not molecular, and so IMFs don't exactly apply, but we still might be comparing physical properties between things that aren't molecular and things that are. What we've been dealing with that's not molecular for the longest time has been ionic, and ionic substances don't exist as molecules because since they're made of charges, the charge is attracted to everything else with the opposite charge in the entirety of the sample. There are no individual molecules. So they're held together by that electrostatic attraction. They tend to be very hard and brittle with high melting points because since they're ionic crystals, they only have one arrangement where the positives and negatives can align with each other and any shift in that is going to create repulsion instead of attraction, making them very brittle. Um, electricity to conduct requires charges or electrons that can move and in the solid state we have charges but they can't move so no electrical conductivity. They also tend to be, I'll add this in here, soluble in water, tend to be, because the hydrogen bonding, the dipoles in the water, can attract the ions and break these apart. The ones that are not soluble in water, the attraction between these ions is simply greater than the attraction between it, whoops, keep grabbing the wrong thing the attraction between the ion and the water molecule plus the entropy that you get from dissolving the solid and creating an, um, an aqueous solution. So the ones that aren't soluble, the, the attraction is greater than this force formation plus the entropy. You can also have covalent substances that are not molecular, and this is if they are crystalline. So they create like a network of bonds where, again, everything in the sample is bonded to everything else through this network rather than individual molecules. And these are held together not by IMFs, but since everything is in the sample is bonded, they're held together by covalent bonds, which means to melt these things, you're not breaking IMFs, and these you truly are breaking bonds, which requires a lot of energy, so they have very, very high melting points. Again, they tend to be very poor conductors of heat and electricity because they have neither charges nor electrons that can move, unless you're graphite, and we'll talk about that when we get to resonance on a later day. Metallic bonds... Uh, also form crystals because here again we're sharing the electrons in this big sea of electrons because they're completely delocalized from all the nuclei so we don't have molecules but we have a crystal however unlike the ionic and the covalent crystals we don't have like a necessary arrangement that these have to make so these can be soft and they can also have a range of melting points. Um, so the, the properties that you could have for a metallic crystal can be very diverse. The one thing that's probably going to always be true, though, is that they're good conductors of heat because you have these electrons that are delocalized 
They're in a big sea of electrons, so they're free to move in response to an electric field. Wrapping up with a crystal that might trick you and make you think that it's kind of a covalent network crystal. Some molecules form crystal. We're familiar with ice. Ice is in molecules, but it's a crystal. Um, this one doesn't show up as well because sugar is such a large molecule, but this is the crystal structure of sugar. Uh, so you can see here's the basic unit within it, and here it is repeating it. So crystal uh, sugar is a crystal, but comes in molecules. Uh, this one made it really clear. This is urea, uh, and it forms a very, very nice crystal. The things that are covalent and molecular that tend to have crystalline solids typically have rather highish intermolecular forces, which means that there's one kind of way to arrange the molecules in a solid so that in the case of water here, the oxygen in this one lines up with the hydrogen in its neighboring ones. So because they tend to have rather high intermolecular forces for molecules, as they solidify, the molecules tend to arrange themselves in a repeating pattern, so those intermolecular forces are optimized. However, even though they're a crystal, they still have properties consistent with other comparable um, molecular substances. They don't have like the high melting points of covalent crystals like diamond or graphite, because when you melt them, you aren't breaking bonds, you're simply overcoming the intermolecular forces between these molecules. So don't get tricked up with that just because it's a In summary, here are the kinds of things that I've talked about. I only talked about the pure substances. I left off the induced dipole or the ion dipole. I, I doubt you'll see those. Um, so just the types of forces in pure substances, ranging from uh, nonpolar molecules that are held together with dispersion. These, general rule, are the weakest, so they have low vapor pressures, so they tend to be gases, low melting points. Um, they're not soluble in water because the water molecules are more attracted to the other water molecules that have dipoles, so they, they don't want to mix with these guys. Um, they tend to be either gases, liquids, or soft solids, and are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Polar molecules um, are held together by, don't forget your dispersion, they're still mo molecules, but dipole-dipole forces, and they're going to have these kinds of properties, but higher, because there's a greater attraction between them. They're also going to be soluble in water because they can be attracted to water's dipoles. Hydrogen bonding, um, they're molecules, so they have dispersion. They have hydrogen bonding. They may also, depending on the size of the molecule, also have a dipole, separate from just a HO, HN, or HF bond. And ditto this but more, because it's a stronger charge. Ionic crystals, we just finished talking about those. They're held together by electrostatic attraction between the ions, which is very strong because you're actually overcoming the ionic bonds when you're trying to melt them. So they have high melting points, tend to be brittle because they have to be held together in this crystal. They may be soluble in water, not always. Um, if the attraction to the dipoles in the water plus the entropy of dissolving it is greater than the electrostatic attractions, they will dissolve in water. Covalent substances, things like diamond and sand, again, are covalent crystals. These have very, very high melting points because you're actually breaking covalent bonds. That also means that they're not soluble in water because to take them apart, again, would be to break covalent bonds. Um, and they have no charges to conduct, um, so they don't conduct very well. And lastly, the metallic crystals, 
uh, since you don't have this fixed network for the crystal, they can be malleable and bendy with a range of melting points. They're also not soluble in water, and the key thing there is that they are good conductors. So part of your assignment is I've got some data here of some mystery substances. There is at least one of every type. So what I would like you to look at for these is I give you their melting point and their boiling point if applicable. Uh, some things might like break down, um, like react with themselves before they actually boil. So just like not applicable. Uh, if they're a solid, I give you their hardness. If they are a liquid, I give you their vapor pressure. And so the vapor pressure is a measure of how easily that they evaporate. And to give you some reference, water's vapor pressure is 3.2. So this one is evaporating about as much as water. This one is evaporating... Uh, more strongly than water because it has a higher pressure from the vapor. I give you if they are soluble in water, which is a polar substance. I give you if they are soluble in hexane, which is a nonpolar substance. And I give you their electrical conductivity as a solid and their electrical conductivity if dissolved in water. So again, there is at least one of each of these types there. Now there's one, two, three, four, five, six of these, and seven of these. So at least one thing gets used twice. So I'll leave it at that. And as always, take care of yourself and others, practice good hygiene, and I'll see you on the flip side.